Otherwise, I think we have a, a lot of uh, really interesting issues that have come up today, even for um, Wake Up sh Sheeple 111, I think, would, would be impressed. 1111, okay, would be impressed with, uh, <laughs> with what we've, uh, we've talked about today. So um, with that, um, questions? Uh, I'm Amos Kolchin from Tel Aviv. And I want to uh, ask uh, whether we don't uh, perhaps pay uh, uh, too much weight, uh, weight on the anatomy. Uh, so human, human beings have changed uh, tremendously over the past, let's say, 50,000 years. So if you compare humans in the uh, Stone Age and today, we're so different in terms of our behavior, our culture, maybe even our intelligence, without any change, I suppose, in the anatomy. So, and, and here we study the, the anatomy of whatever, from flies to uh, humans, and we, we think that we can, from that, derive understanding um, of the behavior. Well, I assume that's to me, yes. Um, is this So, uh, well, I mean, first off, there are a lot of changes that have occurred in that period. For example, there's a lot of dietary uh, uh, sort of physiology changes. There's differences in olfactory receptors. There could well, well be changes in brain growth stuff. But I take your point, though, that I, I don't believe that there's been really any fundamental reorganization of the brain in that point. But we don't need too much. We need. Um, you know, maybe if some stretch receptors in the abdomen changing where they're attached or the time course of recovery from, from trauma uh, extended by maybe what could be a rather simple cellular mechanism. So I, I'm not requiring anatomical changes, just, just a different kind of coding. And, uh, and, I, and I also have no speculations that I'd be prepared to defend at this point about just when this occurred, but it had to be after you could ask for help and get some. So. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Andreas Kalkan from Sweden. Uh, my question is actually also about the anatomy, but from a different attitude now. Um, actually, like when we look at the evolution or like the development of the brain, for example, if you just compare it to monkeys, mm -hmm. then most people point immediately out, oh, look at the frontal cortex, it's like 10 times bigger, like mm -hmm. extended. Um, but it's just like, so to say, bigger, it's inflated. Uh, but we know also, I think, from other literature that for, for, for example, the inferior parietal cortex uh, might contain much new, like, new areas which don't have a homologue to the monkey. Mm -hmm. And it seems that maybe that kind of areas seems to be like also a very interesting candidate for like certain abilities we ascribe to, like, to mm -hmm. higher human cognitive functions. Because, but usually people don't say a lot about that. What do you think about that? Um, it's, it certainly is the case that um, a lot of um, human functions that planning for the future, itineraries, that sort of thing, do depend on the integrity of frontal cortex, and it's larger. Um, so there's two things. First off, um, Harry Jerison showed back in the 70s that the frontal cortex in humans, like the whole cortex in humans, is exactly the size that it should be. So each particular subpart of cortex has its own allometric line. S1 and A1 have the, have the flattest slope, and the, the highest ones are, are posterior, parietal, and frontal. Um, now, what happens as cortex get, gets bigger is that um, these areas begin to fission off, and we've actually looked at how many areas per volume of cortex, so it's an interesting line. It, it looks like it, it goes up kind of linearly to about a ferret-sized brain and then flattens out. So, so I'm not quite sure exactly whether areas, there's a belief that areas are a particular input-output function with you know, committed circuitry. And there, I'm sure a few cases that MT would be a, a good case, for example. But um, committed circuitry and the rest of them uh, you know, in the sense of, uh, you know, particular transmitters, you know, assembling information over certain sizes that are, 
that you can demonstrate are connected to function. I've been looking at it for that for a long time, and it's hard to find any real examples of it. What you see is just this proliferation of size and areas. So, so you rather don't think that the inferior parietal cortex might be generally new area? No, it's not new. So it's a, it's a field homology. The whole, that whole parietal region it's is, just old stretched. Like, is like the original parietal one, and then as it gets bigger, what happens to large areas of cortex is they begin to subdivide into areas by a particular function. Uh, okay, thanks. Hi, I'm Eric uh, from uh, UCAM. Uh, I want to ask a question to uh, Bjorn, Bjorn uh, Brems. Uh, in your paper titled, uh, Towards a Scientific Concept of Free Will as a Biological Trait, uh, you go on suggesting at the end, and I'll quote you, uh, there may be a societal value to, in retaining free will as a valid concept since encouraging a belief in determinism increases cheating, and you cite a <laughs> something uh, uh, don't uh, the the implicit question here is do we need free will to be morally responsible I guess uh, maybe however the theory you offer us doesn't seem current co coherent with the assumption that moral responsibility rely on free will the main problem that I see is that the variation in behavior you're describing as a necessary condition for our free will are only informed by internal stimulus. I won't go into the details, but you say <laughs> that the agent receives, so to speak, spontaneous plans of actions, that is the free part, and then evaluates these plans with the help of information he receives from the environment, that is the will part. Uh, as much as this sounds exciting, moral responsibility doesn't rely really on f the free part of action but more on the will part of action so why do we need this free intrinsic and spontaneous ability to be morally responsible okay there's a whole bunch of things there and I probably would need half a day to address each and every one of them um, the first uh, the first part was concerned an empirical finding and so that's um, and one of the authors, I forgot the name, one of the authors is actually, was actually here, was an empirical finding that um, if you instill disbelief or uh, doubt about uh, whatever the individual, the, the, the uh, candidates perceived as free will, then indeed cheating increased. So that was uh, a citation to an empirical finding. That, of course, has to be seen as completely separate from any considerations of what we would like to call free will. Uh, this whole paragraph in the paper that you were citing was basically about whether it makes sense to develop a scientific concept of what people co call, used to call free will as a dualistic concept, right? Because dualism has been dead for uh, a good couple of uh, decades, and so one might actually uh, think that it would be worth ditching it and using something else, a, a different kind of term for the possibility of choosing between alternatives. Um, so that's an, a short, a shorthand to the first two points, and there was a third point in there um, about internal stimuli. Um, this is something that I've always that that, co that, that comes across uh, come across very often, and I've always wondered what is an internal stimulus. So, for instance, we can take uh, the brains of uh, well, all kinds of mollusks uh, out of there, and, and it works with flies as well. It's just a little bit more tricky. We can take them. Uh, out and put them in a dish and they still produce spontaneous behavior. So that would mean then if this is still internal stimuli, this means that the, um, the brain is generating its own. So the nervous system is generating its own stimuli and then it doesn't really make any sense of talking about stimulus because then stimulus is anything. And so I really don't see what someone could possibly mean by an internal stimulus because that's exactly what um, brains are doing. They generate uh, variability by themselves internally. And so I think that's exactly what we're trying to find out, how it works. How do brains do that? But my, my question was how that is uh, relevant to moral responsibility. It is not related to uh, moral responsibility as the, um, well, it's indirectly related to moral responsibility. Moral responsibility is something that comes on top of the possibility to act. So if, you're, if, if an action is determined entirely by, or to a large part, by components outside of the individual, then you would call it a response. And you cannot, uh, it's hard to 
come up with a rational idea about responsibility um, when you have a causal chain leading up to the, that response. However, if you can assign the cause to the individual, a rational concept of responsibility becomes much easier. So it's a necessary but not a sufficient criterion for responsibility. So if we wouldn't have the ability to act, then there would not be a, a good, dis there wouldn't be a discussion about responsibility. Since we have the possibility to act, we have a necessary but not a sufficient criterion for responsibility. So then a lot of things come on top of that to have, to come to a rational uh, notion of responsibility, but it's not, it's by far not everything, but without it, we wouldn't need a discussion. Jennifer Mather, University of Lethbridge. My question is also for Bjorn and also about free will. But I wanted you to get really much more basic. So I'll try three questions and let's see how far you go. What is free will? Where did it come from evolutionarily? And what the heck has it got to do with consciousness? <laughs> so the, the, first, the first question is, was what it is, what is it? Um, well, I've tried to define it um, biologically, and biologi from a neurobiological perspective, it's the, uh, the possibility to generate behavioral options. And then how did it arise and what was its purpose evolutionarily? I think it arose from, I mean, from behavioral control problems. Initially, the, probably the, the primeval um, reason or adaptive reason for movement has been dispersion. And as um, competition increased the pressure on controlled dispersion, um, there was the, uh, the need to develop um, processes that can guide the movement. And one of the first processes that, that have, um, have ev evolved, uh, that's, um, I've, I've linked that paper somewhere on the blog, I think, um, is, has been phototaxis. And so this is, this, is the, this is where one can see the first, what happens there is that these animals, uh, in, in the paper that I linked to, they first behave and move around randomly and light comes on, a light source at a particular place, and then they all swim towards the light source. And this is um, what these colleagues describe. This is done by the light inhibiting certain components of the movement apparatus rather than triggering anything. And so basically you have a set of movement options, of, in this case realized by moving variably in space, and then this gets this spectrum of behaviors gets limited by uh, sensory stimuli. And this is also something that has been retained. This is what one can see in, in a lot of animals where you can have highly controlled uh, experiment behavioral situations. If you increase the number of stimuli, you decrease the behavioral variability. And uh, what that has to do with um, consciousness, um, again, I think the relation to consciousness is uh, very indirect. Um, I should preface that by, again, emphasizing that uh, I don't really know what consciousness is, and a lot of people with whom I've talked over this past week disagree with my idea of what I think it is. Um, but the, if we didn't have the, if we wouldn't have this option, so it goes a little bit towards the uh, question of responsibility. If we didn't have these alternative options of action, we probably, and there, um, I'm, I'm really way out there, we probably wouldn't have, um, wouldn't be discussing um, questions about consciousness because things would be a lot more mechanistic, would be a lot less flexible, and we probably wouldn't have the need or the possibility or the capability of consciousness. I think, I think that uh, boils down to if we can even agree on what we want to call the capability of choosing among behavioral options in humans, right? So I already got a lot of heat for uh, saying, well, let's not ditch free will just yet. Let's just use it scientifically and not metaphysically. 
And so I wouldn't presume to say that, uh, okay, now I've said that we can use free will in, in humans. Now let's use it in animals as well. I'd like to see if uh, I can get any resonance for keeping the term free will and using scientifically. I'm not married to the term. I can use a different term. If someone has a good idea of what to call um, a non-dualistic capability of choosing among behavioral options, and it's as catchy and as easy to explain to the general population as free will, I'm ready. Uh, Pauline, University of Montreal. Uh, this is a question for the whole panel. Um, a quite general question popped up in my head when uh, Professor Singer presented briefly the two hypotheses commonly found uh, in neuroscience about uh, neurobiological structures underlying consciousness, mainly that consciousness might be either uh, produced and controlled in some specific parts of the brain or in the entire brain. But isn't it a mistake to see consciousness as a thing uh, that is produced and controlled by specific structures rather than seeing consciousness as a general neural state that is a, the, the consequence of the, uh, a combination of all the other cognitive abilities that do have the, the, um, their own uh, underlying st structures and, and that interact together and which would mean that uh, consciousness uh, does not really have a proper, a, a proper neural circuitry. I think, I, I think I'm going to try to answer that question. I think in, um, it doesn't have a proper neural circuitry. I agree. I mean, if you're looking for neural correlates of consciousness, and you're using color spots, perhaps you're going to find it somewhere else in the brain. And if you're using random movements or random dots or something like that, I, I would say one of the things that I wanted to, to, to tell at the end of my talk was that there is no such a thing as a brain structure the way that I see, that every time that you do it and you do an experiment, it's going to light up and say, okay, this is a neural correlate of consciousness. Perhaps you find a structure, but when you go and dig into the neurons that are activated within that structure, you're going to find a totally different set of neurons. Like, for example, in prefrontal cortex, we see that. We find different sets for something that is on the right or on the left or at the bottom, and things like that, because there are different things. So, yeah, I, I don't think that is going to be something that is going to be variable, and this is part of the uh, constant. This is part of the problem. And if you translated that across a species, if you're trying to look for consciousness in a mouse, or you're trying to look for consciousness in a monkey, or neural correlate, and in a human, it may get even worse. Because you may not even activate the same brain areas, or, or the homolog areas uh, in, in different places. So uh, that said, it is possible that consciousness has different levels of complexity. And what you would call consciousness in a human may not be the same as in a monkey or well, it's not been the same as in a mouse or in a fly, or you can go down to as much as you want. So it depends how do you define it. So as a neurophysiologist, the way that I say is, yes, it doesn't have a specific neural circuitry. Maybe there is a structure that could be uh, across a species that play a role, but play a role in the activation and in the whole process that has to do with it. And if you activate this structure alone, probably you won't get consciousness either. So you have to activate the whole structure, and it's going to change from experiment to experiment. Okay, That's so right. you, you would say that consciousness is not really, is not really a thing I itself. It's not something that is produced by a, by a, specific, si uh, a, a specific system. It's more something that is the result of the combination of several other abilities. Yeah, I would say it's, it's, uh, the, the way that I see is the result of the combination of of the activation of different part of a system that is highly distributed. And it does, even if the result is perception, you can say, well, I call it perception of motion, perception of color, perception of, and you can keep going with that conscious perception of. And the only thing that is common in those things is the word perception. Because when you look at brains activated during motion perception or during uh, color perception, there are different areas and probably different neurons within an area. Even if you find the area, an area that is activated across them, you find different neurons. So that's, yeah. Uh, 
I'm, I'm still confused about uh, when I talk about a neural correlate of something, I imagine one axis is my neural activity or my populations of activity or my different neural areas. You can put anything you want on one axis. But the other axis, you, you put what you're studying. So we want to put consciousness on that axis and move it back and forth and then see how our other neural correlates move together. And that's how we find these correlations. And that works for things like wakefulness. You can move sleep, wake, sleep, wake, and I can have neural activity you know, go up and down, up and down, or change from these different regions and the reticular activating system and other places. Okay, and I can see these correlations, or I can have visual perception moving back and forth on one axis and neural activity moving on the other axis. But no one's told me what to move back and forth to study consciousness. Okay, I think it's things like visual perception, but I've, I've never had anyone say, oh, for consciousness, we, ne we need to measure this, this, and this back and forth, and then we'll see which areas in the brain also move along with it, and we can form our correlations. So that's, uh, that's my stopping area from the very beginning, you know, the part that I find difficult to start off with is when we want to call a neural correlate of consciousness, uh, what are we varying to measure these correlates? Okay. Visual but, perception is a good one. I think that's a good one, and maybe some of you agree, but there's probably a lot of other ways you could do it that might be even better. So. But isn't it a mistake to only study one specific structure in the brain oh, no, instead of could. seeing consciousness as a whole, and you can't study consciousness if you don't study the whole at, at the same time? I think it's wide open. Too bad Wolf Singer's not here. You can very perception, for example, visual perception on one axis, and then very uh, the resonance or the synchrony between various areas on your other axis. I mean, you can put whatever you want to define on your y-axis, uh, but and, and there's plenty of things to put there, different areas, how they interact, single areas, but it's the x-axis. I don't know what to put on that axis when you say consciousness, but if you say visual perception or wakefulness or certain motor planning or movement, then we know how to how to measure these correlations. If I could, uh, yeah, I got one. Uh, <coughs> channel Bjorn Merker very poorly for a moment. Uh, I believe he would argue that we need to look first for the set of probably thalamic mesencephalic structures that generate a egocentric map that has both perceptual motor and motivational concepts to it and we don't we haven't thought about that structure in that way and then I think a lot of the other things are going to are, are going to be things that populate that representation with its content so I, I think I, I'm going to go for a much more physical account of uh, of what to look for than these others I think <laughs> so. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I guess I'd be more on the side of what Eric was saying. In fact, I heard a, what I thought was a good analogy, which is that consciousness, consciousness is kind of like the sky. So if you say that you, you're interested in the sky, almost everyone knows what the sky is. It's sort of a very nice term. It conjures images to mind. But uh, you wouldn't study the sky scientifically. You wouldn't necessarily have a conference about the sky. You would have a conference about uh, the physics of light or the climate aspects of refracting light or the cosmology of things that produce light or the visual perception of color. So if you just sort of ask yourself, what is the sky, you end up with every person who's involved in the discussion having their own idea about what it is. And uh, every one of those ideas is right, because it is all of those things, and it's the interaction of all those things. So your point about uh, the conscious, well, Everyone over there, I'm not disagreeing with you, but uh, the point about the fact that it could be distributed across brain regions and the fact that it could be different for different types of paradigms almost has to be true until you have a very much more precise kind of definition of what you're talking about. Right over here. Uh, hi, Josh Sanchez from University of Wisconsin Madison. Um, this question is mostly for Eric, Julio, and uh, Bjorn. Um, so this idea has been thrown around a bit um, about how when you're doing animal studies, you're having them do a task that isn't something that they would encounter in the wild. So then they're um, forced to make an association that they wouldn't naturally make. Um, so this has been brought up 
uh, and I don't really have a background in LFPs or animal studies, but I was wondering if it would be possible or interesting, um, well, to back up just a little bit, you, it seems like you train your animals for a task and then you take recordings of like how this new network that you've created works um, or this new association works. And I'm wondering about the potential to somehow measure during that process of learning to see if you can see the association being created in the neural networks or see if like this new circuit will pop out during that training process. Yeah, I think that is uh, obviously this is a great idea. I mean learning is another field that people do a lot of research on in our area. One of the difficult things is when you do long-term learning you have to test on the same animal for a long period of time, and you have to keep probably the same neurons, the same network. So you have to monitor the same network and see how the weights change for a long period of time. We got to the point where we can keep a good set of neurons during, let's say, three, four hours when the animal is learning something. So that's the stage where we are now, and we're doing some experiments on that, and, and, and that's the but it has been a difficult in the field. So because you want to do recordings in awake animals, and at the same time you want to isolate single neurons, because LFPs are not that informative about what the single neurons are doing. So um, it's a difficulty to assess long-term learning. Uh, when you're looking at working memory, that what you saw the data, or, or, or short-term learning and things like that, is easier to do. And even if you record from a chronically implanted uh, set of electrodes, and you record today and tomorrow, it's very likely that you're recording from different neurons. So that is the difficulty of keeping the animal alive, uh, being not invasive when you do uh, your recordings and your things, because we also have to make sure that the animal is healthy and all that kind of things that go with the protocol for research, and it's very difficult. So I think that we, you will see a lot of things coming in short-term learning, probably over with, with the uh, uh, chronic implants that now people keep for several hours, even a couple of days or something like that, over the next, uh, I think, years. Long-term, I'm not sure uh, in the monkeys. I mean, it's going to be a tough one. I can answer very quickly for invertebrates. Yes, on basically all accounts, we can both monitor and interfere with virtually all neurons involved in learning and memory on various timescales. Go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm Juliet, University of Montreal. My question is for Dr. Finlay. Uh, I was wondering, what's your, uh, what do you think about the idea that um, the actual uh, anatomical ability for speech would be a distinguishing feature in the evolution of cognitive abilities in human? Um, well, I mean, it, it definitely is a distinguishing feature. Do you want the distinguishing feature? What is the sense of your question? Um, um, well, when we look for what allowed um, mm -hmm. the evolution of cognitive abilities, and that that would be uh, like a, mm -hmm. a jump that allows them to mm -hmm. um, both in both in birds and and I think in in humans there's um, more distribution of telencephalon directly to um, you know hypoglossal and and some spinal motor nuclei possibly more than you'd get by Having a larger cortex alone, you know, so so there there could be some change in axon pathways, maybe some speed. Um, well, I was uh, I so was thinking I mean, about so it. So I guess what what's the? I was thinking about it in terms of the fact that um, you know you mentioned a lot the role of um, social interaction, mm -hmm. for example, in pain, and mm -hmm. uh, so to me I thought speech is could be related to, to social interaction and therefore uh, to uh, a lot oh. of evolution of cognitive abilities, um, perhaps consciousness as well. Oh, I see. Um, well, well, one thing that's interesting about getting a, a full representation of the viscerosensory and gustatory system to the cortex is perhaps then you can talk about it. <laughs> I, you know, so, so you're getting this 
basically the way I see that in a mechanistic term is you're, you're delivering that sensory array to the big autocorrelator, and which is the same structure that is going to be finding categories in language. So I can see how these two things could, could conceivably interact. Um, but not necessarily be uh, causal or have a main role in. I can't hear what you said. Not, not necessarily having a main role in the evolution of human uh, I, uh, well, abilities. Well, it's a question of, uh, you know, do we want one role? I mean, I think there's a whole lot of. Yeah, but <laughs> I, I, I'm so. thinking of it in terms of contrasting because we yeah. look for neural correlates. So, mm -hmm. uh, but then, uh, as I understood, you said. Uh, it doesn't seem like there is so much difference in the brain itself. So could it be that the difference could be actually uh, something else, like um, the ability for speech, which uh, that once you can speak, change, then it, right? Sorry, that has to be a neural change, right? Uh, I well, and <laughs> as I understood it, you, you can teach sign language to to chimps, right? Mm -hmm. um, but they cannot speak. So um, I, I was thinking that this should have an influence mm -hmm. on how uh, the infant when how, and yeah how the infant develops and yeah. uh, the chimps the infant doesn't uh, grow up with a, a complex language whereas the human infant does um, I, I think you're perfectly right I actually wrote a paper about this kind of point a while back which is uh, I tried to find every primary cause ever published about what's special about humans <laughs> Okay, and you come up with a list of 20 or 30 things in different classes, which are going to be language or social interaction, planning for the future, tool use. I get, uh, I get a proposal on one of those in BBS every week. Okay, <laughs> and um, so, and I'm not saying that to, to minimize your point. It's just that that this, I think those are they're all true. They're all um, important components. So you can either. Um, I think try to direct yourself to what is an unanswerable question of which is the very first, or find out what coordinates them. And I'm going for the whole brain structure. Uh, it's just yeah. I, I thought you meant in your talk that uh, I, I don't know if I understood correctly, but you, I thought you, you meant that uh, it's very difficult. It seems like there isn't really something special about the brain itself. Right? Well, I, I, gave, I saw that in general on the size there is not, but there is something really special reorganized in primates. I don't know about in humans, there's no comparative studies of monkeys versus humans in organization of the insula, um, but I told you about three separate ways that the organization of the insula differs in primates compared to, to rodents. So, so my point was that, that brain size were very predictable. Um, organizations, this pathway seems unique. So I didn't was not trying to make an argument. There are no differences in brains. You just have to look for the ones that are informative about niche-related changes, and that's not usually whole brain size. I see. Okay. Thank you. On the left, uh, I am Felix uh, from uh, University of Montreal, and my uh, question is for uh, Professor Eric Cook. And I was uh, f first of all. Uh, uh, you showed a uh, feed-forward uh, model, but you didn't show uh, any feedback model. Is that correct? All right. Okay. Yeah. And um, I was wondering uh, uh, also, uh, what was the aim of doing such a model? Did, did you aim at, at proving that uh, the feed feed-forward processes are a sufficient condition for uh, uh, for causing the, the the phenomenon you were talking about, or, or were you rather talking about? Uh, uh, necessary conditions for uh, such phenomena. So I asked the question because I'm wondering why did you do a feed-forward model instead of a feedback model? And uh, in, in either cases, uh, whether you try to prove that it is sufficient or uh, necessary, I don't see uh, reasons for uh, doing a feedforward model only and that both of them. Uh, um, it, it comes down to something much more mundane is uh, uh, you know, there's an infinite class of models that would account for our data. And so I think it's the most informative model is the simplest model, okay, that, that can explain your data. And so I certainly could, you could add in feedback mechanisms from attention and, uh, or, or changes in internal state, and you could still account for our measurements, but uh, I don't need to. 
Okay. At this point. Now, I can't, that does not mean these kind of signals are not there when the animal perceives the stimulus from when he doesn't perceive the stimulus. And at the very end, I tried to add in a little looking at some of these different frequency bands of LLPs where maybe you can start to think about these feedback signals, signals that arise from the changes in internal state uh, which may be related to things like perception. But uh, just to explain the, the link between the neural fluctuations in behavior, the feed forward accounted for most all of uh, that relationship. So why go any further? Why would it what? Why add more complexity? Feedback yeah. would be more complexity. Why, why add more parameters? Yeah, I understand. It, it comes down just to that. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but there's some evidences of uh, feed feedback processes also. So. Uh, ultimately, uh, any model of uh, cognitive processing should, uh, I think, to some, maybe but not in the experiment you did, maybe in that kind of processing, feed, feed forward or sufficient. But uh, ultimately, uh, to explain uh, may, maybe other processes, feedback model would be, uh, feed for, feedback, yeah. Would right, be so he, we put the animals in a very stereotypical task where they were looking for a signal buried yeah. in noise. And um, uh, there was, you know, they put their internal state which is where maybe all the interesting things are happening into a certain mode of doing this, and this is where we made our measurements. So what you are proposing is let's have a more interesting task or something, again, on this. Let's vary something that's closer to what we might think about what consciousness is, vary, vary a task, vary some kind of visual perceptual experiment, and then set ourselves up where feedback signals, changes in internal state are become critical. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Uh, hi, Xavier Derry, uh, University of Montreal. Uh, oh, wait. I'm sorry. I want to add something to, to, to you, what Eric. Uh, I want to say that not all processes require feedback. For example, if you're talking about reflexive saccades, you talk about just very compl very simple acts, you can just have a fit forward model and explain it. So, so it's, it's uh, not always required. Good. Sorry. Uh, my question is for Professor Finley. Um, it, from my understanding, the more complex and multivariable a system becomes, the more chances it has go, to go awry, to go out of control. Um, maybe not. Well, I'm, it's it's my impression. I, I mean, I've never seen, I've never heard of a, of a schizophrenic aplesia, for instance. Um, well, yeah, maybe. <laughs> But actually, if the answer is yes to that question, it might actually reinforce your point. Um, so your theory about the uh, evolution of the specific uh, pain system for humans um, as having the function of uh, enticing others to, to help us, uh, mm -hmm. therefore increasing individual fitness, uh, would you think that um, chronic debilitating pain that doesn't seem to have any reason or uh, doesn't add anything more mm -hmm. to the fitness of the individual, but it's very detrimental at the opposite. Do you think it would be an example of uh, a little part of the variation, that extreme where the system that has evolved in, at, in some form just goes terribly wrong and yeah. out of hand? Yeah, I, um, I've spent a while in the last couple years looking through the medical literature on just that kind of thing. and. Um, um, and, you know, and it's, it hasn't really been considered. In fact, the whole placebo literature isn't considered a great deal in terms of mechanism. And I think, I think if you put this um, different frame around a lot of diseases, it may be easier to understand a whole lot of syn syndromes as, as sort of disorders of the help-seeking mechanism as opposed to the disorder of a of pharmacological component of, of you know, GABA or, you know, or some particular part of the pain circuitry. So, um, yeah, absolutely. But that this hasn't been done yet to think of things. Right, it's kind of hard to measure. Yeah, but. yeah I think it would be really, that's exactly what I would like to encourage people to think about because that's not something I know much about. Thank you. I'd have a wild speculation in that direction. If you were, were able to closely monitor 7 billion individuals of almost any species, you'd be surprised what kind of disorders you would be able to find. Uh, I have a, just a question for uh, Barbara Finley also. You're very popular today, it seems. Um, it's just really a, a, a 
trying to pick your brains um, in the in the hopes of finding something that uh, explains the difference in, in human and primate brains. Um, Steve Weiss has made a um, a big deal about the granule frontal cortex, granule prefrontal cortex, uh, suggesting that it exists in primates but not in other mammals. Is that actually, from your knowledge of the literature, which is much greater than mine, is that, um, do you think that's uh, on the right track or do you think that's another case of a predictable size-like relationship that doesn't actually have any functional implications? Would you say a granular or granular? Granular. granular. Um, well, the insula thing I just showed you is an example of uh, um, granular, not frontal, but sort of in the general region cortex that hadn't been there before. Um, well, he's pointing to a large percentage of the prefrontal cortex there. I, uh, uh, Mike, I'm not sure what the case is there because I, I never became interested in this granularity issue mm -hmm. until very recently, but. Uh, uh, Mike Shavlin the other day was arguing that that the uh, uh, change in brains was exactly the opposite of that, which was really my belief to begin with, that, that what was expanded the most was the agranular part. So I guess I, oh, I maybe don't I got know what the data really are. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, Vincent from, uh, from uh, UCAM. So my question goes to each of you uh, people who use the attended versus unattended stimuli. Uh, I asked this question at uh, the panel uh, two days ago, but couldn't get a, an answer. I'm wondering if one of you could possibly answer this. Um, so we see a clear difference between attended stimuli and unattended stimuli. Now, uh, we have a good idea of what attention is, but do we have any idea of how it is created? Or how, how it is, what are the processes that explain attention? Because to me it seems as esoteric as consciousness is right now. I mean, we're, oh well, it's at, uh, he, he's attending the stimulus, so, well, that's why we get this kind of response, but I mean, what explains attend, then, attending a stimulus? I don't, I don't That was it. personal. <laughs> uh, actually, actually, no. Actually, it wasn't. I I, actually, it wasn't at all. I, I, I had this, uh, this discussion also with Paul uh, Sisek, actually, and and I got disappointed with Tommy. Attention, that doesn't exist at some point. I said, well, <laughs> maybe we're calling uh, the same thing uh, different names. So the way that I say it uh, is it, a process, is a brain mechanism. The problem is that when we conceptualize things in psychology and we put it in boxes. And then now we want to bring it to physiology, and now we have a problem that the boxes, they don't fit in very well, or the boxes overlap a lot. So then a physiologist is a very hard thing to when we have the dialogue with, with psychologists or clinical psychologists, sometimes MDs too, because they categorize diseases. So attention, the way that I see it is as, as a filtering mechanism. So the brain has a, a limited processing capacity, and you need to filter out information. If you don't filter out information, you end up with ADHD or with some kind of, uh, for example, autistic kids that they can filter out things, and then your performance in normal tasks is not going to be good, or it's not going to be. That said, a child with an ADHD who generally is going to do just good being a hunter probably is going to be a good one because he kill an animal and go to kill the other one, go to kill the other one, go to kill the other one. So it may be something that is evolutionary, and we call it a disease, of course, or we call it a brain condition and things like that. So attention, basically, I see as a filtering mechanism. There are two forms of attention. One is exogenous, and the other is endogenous. What, the exogenous is the one that you call a pop-out stimulus. So if you are here and someone shouts loud there, your attention goes right away there because there is something important. What that means is that you're favoring just a stream of processing from that retinotopic location into your brain, and the other things don't receive the same priority of processing. That's the way that I see. The way that you can implement that is by having control areas, for example, in the frontal cortex, where you hold memory representation, working memory representations, or, I mean, so, sorry, exogenous attention is a little bit different. You can implement it through lateral inhibition and through things like that, winner take all mechanism in an area. Voluntary attention is a little bit more tricky, so you need control areas and you need to know what you're attending to a mental representation of that in working memory, and then you can route the information from the locations that you want or the features that you want, or if there are color areas, you can just bust the gain of neurons so that when the sensory input comes, for example, the neurons are going to be more responsive and going to encode the stimulus better. 
that's the way that I see attention. It's a mechanism and has different flavors. One is endogenous and extrogenous, and then we keep splitting it. Spatial attention, feature-based attention, object-based attention, what does that mean? It means that the mechanism perhaps targets different parts of the brain, different group of neurons, and, and that's how we call them. But that's how I see attention. It's a filtering mechanism, and it also has an amplifier added, which is what I was telling you about the contrast. Well, that all makes sense, except we can't by that doesn't explain, uh, I mean, I understand how it works, but how it is implemented? I mean, how do I, h how come does one specific stimula stimulus grabs my attention, another doesn't? And how do I decide, I mean, is there free will in there? <laughs> or, yeah. or some kind of other force that says, oh, now you put your attention on this. In exogenous attention, there is very little free will. You can help. If someone shouts your name or something like that, it's going to go there. So if that is what, what you're referring to, if something very bright happens, your attention is going to go there. I mean, you can do experiments on that, try to block it, try to do things, but there is little that you can do. In endogenous voluntary attention, you can directly where you want it. And where you want it, I don't want to go back because I'm going to go into free will. I pass the ball. Don't want to do that, but you can direct attention where you want it. Let's say if you're looking for, you want to eat, you're looking for some sign that means food, second cup, something like that. So, and that's where your attention goes, and you're better at detecting signs like second cup look like. You're going to be very good at doing that, and very bad at doing everything else, or things that are very different from that. Uh, you say you want food. My question is, who is you? That's, that's, my, that's actually my question. Oh, well, <laughs> me is my hypothalamus and my glucose levels that went down, something like that. Uh, that. That's the best answer that I can give you. Now, my frontal cortex knows where, what to look for, and which neurons in visual cortex you should enhance the, the processing so that you will detect those signs. Um, who is me? Well, I know who I am, but uh, <laughs> I pass that to Bjorn if he wants to talk about free will. <laughs> But uh, attention is implemented through connections. I think very likely through feedback connections, the voluntary attention from frontal cortex or parietal cortex toward visual areas or sensory areas in general. Okay. Well, thank you. Sorry. In, in, fa in fact, there are similarities, and I think uh, Paul Chisek pointed that out uh, yesterday between selection on the sensory side and selection on the action side. And uh, those, go actually, those go, well, depending on your expectations, surprisingly far. So uh, certain dynamics in um, vis selective visual attention in flies, if you can, you can record those by local field potentials um, and, and match them to, uh, if you wanted to, behavior, behavioral output. And what you find are dynamics that are uh, reminiscent of each other. So it's not, there's no direct evidence. But it's not inconceivable that indeed similar, conceptually similar selection processes are at hand when selecting actions and when selecting um, objects out of the environment by using attentional or attention like processes. Okay, thanks to you both. Okay, we have time for a couple more. Go ahead. Hi, uh, the question goes to Chris Pack. Uh, as often when you develop models of uh, the neural system, you, uh, you can find some solutions in which you have a model that explains the data, but you don't find the implementation of the model in the, in the brain. And this is pretty much what you seem to, uh, you, you find a model that can explain some of the data from V1 to up to MST. But uh, <clears throat> if you don't find any neurons that implement the nonlinearity that you, uh, that you the, the almost binary nonlinearity that you have found, what does it mean from uh, what does it mean for for the validity of your model, from a, just from a scientific point of view? Oh yeah. Um, uh, well, I wouldn't say it. So this is a very general philosophical question yeah. about whether you can map the elements of a particular theory onto actual things that exist in the world. Uh, we, so in a sense, you might say we don't care as long as we have a model that fits the data, but that would be very silly because we're also experimentalists and we want to be able to go and find the elements and get a better understanding of them. So uh, we've hedged against that by using as inputs to each model air, uh, the outputs of neurons from which we have decades of experience in studying them, These are especially area MT. Now when the model doesn't work, you, we threw in this <coughs> set of hacks uh, that make it work, but the, the hacks are, are 
I don't think it's really fair to say that they don't exist in the brain. In fact, they, they're found constantly in the brain. Uh, these are just nonlinear operations that one can find everywhere. What we can say is that you can observe them with extracellular recordings from single neurons in, say, MT. If, if you wanted to make that claim, you would find neurons that had bizarrely non-physiological uh, tuning curves. So to me, that's, that's a really excellent use of modeling because now I can go in and look for this as an experimentalist and see where does this occur and I've narrowed it down quite a bit. Either I have a completely wrong model of MT which would be kind of sad because this is like the most thoroughly studied area of the brain or there's something that I'm missing which happens and I can say that it has to happen between the spiking output of one neuron in say MT and the, uh, the input to an area like MST. So to me, this, this makes a very strong prediction for something like synaptic depression, which we can now, and in fact, we are now trying to figure out how to, how to study. So um, that could turn out to be wrong. Our first intuitions about the system were wrong. Uh, but if it's right, then I think we've learned something through the modeling, and that's what I, I think ultimately the modeling, that's the most you can ever hope for. Okay. That's good. Thank you. Um, Diego Mendoza from McGill University. So uh, a couple of the speakers uh, referred often to the the neural correlates of conscious experience, um, and this is a term I think is inherited a lot from the legacy of of uh, Crick and and Koch, who in the back in the 90s very gently and very shyly proposed that you could actually go in the brain and find that. Um, now I think the the word correlate was very well thought by them not to create too much. Uh, um, too much of a, a response uh, just to say, okay, the first thing that, that scientists look for is correlation. I think we should stop that shyness and just go and say what we're looking for is the neural causes of consciousness. And that, I think we're, we're getting, I mean, there's, there's a lot to be done, but we're starting to get ready to do that by, you know, uh, developing techniques of, of causality, like, you know, lesioning studies that can be at, down to the cellular level, up to brain areas, um, using now the newly um, uh, developed optogenetics and, and other things to, to actually inhibit or manipulate the system and then cause uh, n n normal function, n normal conscious function to either disappear or reappear at will. So I'd like to know what, what, what you think about that and, and how we can actually, you know, maybe by, by, by manipulating the brain with these, with these things, not go, go beyond just causality and say, okay, these, these uh, particular element, a neural element or a neural process um, is necessary and, and a particular um, set of neural elements, elements are not just necessary but sufficient to um, to support a particular conscious experience. <laughs> well, I guess I guess maybe I don't understand how this is different from the standard uh, microstimulation experiment. So the microstimulation experiments prove uh, that the animal sees something and reports on it. So operationally, I'd say that's pretty strong evidence. Now, it, are you sort of weaseling about what it means to be conscious of what the animal is seeing, or, or, or what, um, what, else would, what else would make you happy? No, <laughs> I'm just talking about, you know, everyone, no one talks about neuro, the neural causes of consciousness. Everyone talks about the neural correlates of consciousness. I, I, I think that's, that's, you know, very, very diplomatic, but I think we, we, have, we can be strong enough to say, okay, we, we look for the neural causes of memory, of attention, of this, of that. Uh, let's go ahead and call it, call it the neural causes of consciousness or well, a, con of a sure particular a, conscious experience. I'm not sure it's an entirely sensible question. I, I mean, you could go and stimulate the brain stem, the, the reticular formation. You would find something that caused or, it, or abolished consciousness. But I don't know if that would be a very satisfying answer, right? It's a conscious experience I'm talking about, not just conscious in general, but uh, <laughs> let's say a particular experience of seeing uh, your face in this particular place of the visual field, this and that. That particular conscious experience must have some neural events that, that support it. That's, that, that's the kind of uh, uh, 
thing I'm talking all you about. All is the operational report of the animal with whom you can't really communicate about highfalutin philosophical terms, then how can you distinguish between a sort of mechanical response, i.e. I've stimulated area IT and it, with exactly the right pattern to create Diego's face, the animal presses the button for Diego, but he's, he's a zombie, he's enslaved by the microstimulation versus he's experiencing Diego uh, in a conscious sense. How would you ever distinguish between those two? Or are you proposing doing uh, manipulating something in a human who can tell you specifically about the subjective experiences of your manipulations? Well, in binocular rivalry, we know that it's really something that, that, our, that we are experiencing. It's not just an automatic thing. I really see it or I don't see it. And then when you look at monkeys, they respond in the same patterns that humans. So, I mean, it's not complete evidence, but, but it, it strongly supports that monkeys are probably doing the same thing as, or perceiving something very similar to humans. So the, there, there are ways to, uh, to ask uh, animals to report their conscious experiences, I think. I don't know. Go for okay. It. <laughs> well, let's, uh, we've run out of time, unfortunately. It's five after. So let's thank our speakers one more time. <laughs>